Good day. I am Sergio Lugo, representing the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library and the Rocky Mountain Stamp Show as the moderator for the presentations you will see involving Mexico's great postal fraud of 1870 and 1871. The presentation is a three-part examination of the fraud from the perspectives of three experts on the subject. Our presenters are Nicholas Follinsby, who developed a strong history and interest in Mexican stamps in his teens, with the issue of 1868 postal forgeries becoming a major interest. He has written numerous articles for Mexicana, mostly on stamps of the 1913 to 1917 revolution. In 1996, his book on this subject was published by the Collectors Club of Chicago. He later published four editions of a specialized catalog of the issues from 1856 to 1910. For 26 years, he ran large auctions of Mexican philatelic material. Dr. Grace tackles one of the most complex areas of Mexican philately. He is a serious student and exhibitor of Mexico philately. Dr. Grace has been a member and past president of MEPSI. John Cordich has specialized in Mexico for four decades. A life member of the Mexico Elmhurst Philatelic Society International, also known as MEPSI, and has been a director, treasurer, and president of MEPSI. He has been a participant and presenter at annual meetings of MEPSI since 1980. He authored the Index of Mexicana, between 1952 and 2001, and 50 of the journal's articles. Please welcome Messrs. Follinsby, Grace, and Cordage. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk about a major crime. The great Mexican postal fraud is probably the world's most extensive and long-lasting postal fraud and from a philatelic point of view, is probably the best postal fraud because of all the wonderful varieties that it generated to challenge and amuse us today. Starting in late 1858, Mexico suffered three years of civil war followed by a French intervention on behalf of the losing side, the attempted imposition of Austrian Archduke to become Emperor of Mexico. And once the Republic triumphed against all of this, and Maximilian was shot in June 1867, Mexico was left in economic ruin from all this chaos and violence. Most mail in 19th century Mexico was correspondence relating to business. And so it's natural that the condition of the economy would be reflected by the volume of stamp sales. The fact that from the time of the restoration of the, of the Republic until a year and a half later, September 1868, there was no national issue of postage stamps. What does that tell you about the economy? The 1868 issue, like most all Mexican stamps before 1884, bore overprints. The numbers 1 to 41 represented the postal districts, and these were separated at some distance, as you see, from two numbers representing the year of issue, 68, 69, 70, etc. These were typographed in Mexico City. But then they were sent to the various districts, and there they received the district name. The purpose of this district name was to validate the stamps. 1869 was a year of substantial economic recovery. And this was, was reflected by steadily increasing sales of stamps in nearly all parts of the country. 1870 sales should have been at least as good and were in most parts, 
while 1871 was even better with at least a 15% increase in stamp sales throughout most of the country. But in Mexico City, something was terribly wrong. Here, where the economy was strongest, sales declined drastically. Our graph shows with a dotted line what projected sales should have been, at least by estimate, for 1870 and 71, and the solid line represents the actual sales. You had roughly 141,000 25 centavo stamps sold in 1869. In 1870, the sales were down to 114,000, and 1871 down to a paltry 93,000. On the other hand, well, let me say that initially it was assumed that the stamps, that, that this deficit or this difference in sales was caused by stamps migrating out of district. Stamps were often used as a method of payment for smaller purchases. There was no postal money order system. There wasn't even a bank checking system. In fact, the Mexican fiscal system was so primitive that only coinage was uh, circulating as money. No paper currency. So it was natural that small purchases might be paid for in postage stamps. This was particularly true of newspaper and periodical subscriptions. But the growing loss in postal revenue eventually made it obvious that large-scale fraud was going on. Estimated projections of how many stamps should have been sold in Mexico City compared to actual sales suggest that of 25 centavo stamps, perhaps as many as 30,000 postal forgeries were used with 70 year overprints, and perhaps between 60,000 and 75,000 with 71 year overprints. The 50 centavos was the other denomination where a great many fraudulent stamps were passed, perhaps as many as 20, 25,000 altogether in this period. We go back to our first scan for a revelation. These only seem to be showing the 1868 issue. They are actually postal forgeries. But it would take a very well-informed philatelist to realize this. This is a somewhat unusual group of them. Any six centavos is a rarity because only somewhere between three, maybe four sheets were printed. And I'm guessing that there are probably 10 or 12 of these stamps in collector hands today, at least recognized. The 12 centavo green paper stamp is fairly common in 1871, but any with a 70 year overprint is a real rarity, probably possibly as rare as the six centavos, except that there are more varieties of it. Most postal forgeries were used from Mexico City. Estimates range between 85% and 95% of the postal forgeries were used for Mexico City. But our 25 centavos here is used from Guanajuato, which is quite unusual. The 50 centavos is perforated. That's normal for a one 1870 stamp from District Mexico, but from any other district, it's quite difficult. And any hundred centavos is, at the very least, fairly scarce. Comparing genuine stamps with postal forgeries, the basic stamps look the same for good reason. They were lithographed from the same stone as the genuine stamps. In other words, the fraud was an inside job involving a pressman or two working after hours in the government's printing facility. Plus, presumably someone higher up in the postal department who would have the connections to handle the marketing of the various products. Suspicion falls on the Director General, Luis Gutierrez Correa, who resigned or was replaced two days before a circular was issued in February 1872 officially announcing the fraud. 
that no one was apparently ever prosecuted for this crime was probably due to the government's desire to avoid a scandal. This is particularly understandable if you realize that the same printing plant that printed the stamps also printed government bonds. Uh-oh. Of course, any lack of confidence in the bonds could have a pretty bad effect on the overall economy. When the fund first began, the perpetrators pilfered paper from the available supplies in the government printing facility, perhaps whatever was sitting next to the press. But as the scale of the operation increased, they realized that they should procure their own supply of paper and bring it in so as to avoid attracting suspicion. This was usually not a perfect match to what the government was using. 12 centavos forgeries of 1871 were usually printed on a sea green or somewhat darker bluish green paper compared to the stamp on the left, which is printed on government paper. Many, but not all, 25 centavos were printed on a paper that was thinner and pinker than what the government was using, but not always. The 50 centavos was often printed on a lemon yellow or even a straw colored paper, whereas the genuine paper that the government used was a somewhat stronger yellow color, though sometimes that yellow colored paper was used for postal forgeries as well at first. The 100 centavos was sometimes printed on a very thick paper, but also on pilfered government paper. They didn't print very many of these stamps, so who was going to miss a few pieces of brown paper? Before the forgeries could be marketed, they needed to have the district and year typeset overprints applied and also a district name. Although most of the stamps would be sold and used in Mexico City, a wide variety of district overprints were applied. Why the variety? Recall that stamps were often used for payments for merchandise and subscriptions, so there was already a legitimate trade in discount postage where businesses, especially publishers, disposed of their accumulated excess. This excess postage often originated from outside of Mexico District. The production of postal forgeries with various district overprints was designed to blend into this traffic. And it is even quite possible that Gutierrez Correa or whoever masterminded the fraud recruited some publisher or other occasional marketer of discount postage to handle the sale of the postal forgeries. After all, it might seem a bit strange for a senior official of the Postal Department to be selling postage at a discount. To recognize postal forgeries, one mainly studies the overprints. In the present two stamps, the genuine stamp has the numbers 670 spaced a little closer together than the 671 in the stamp on the right, which is the forgery as labeled. It's a helpful clue, but it's not necessarily conclusive. The district name is probably the most reliable indicator. The size and font style must be compared against known genuine stamps. But after a while, you can see fairly readily the characteristics of most of the postal forgery overprints. The font is usually the same height, and the same style. And that's regardless of district, so they have their own look. But not always, there are some exceptions. We see a couple of them now. It's useful to think of postal forgeries as belonging to four periods. The first would be stamps with 69 year overprints, produced very late in the year, which is why we titled the seminar 1870 to 71. Most of them were used in those years, but a few were produced in 69 and a few, even a couple were produced in 72. And some of the earlier stamps were used in 72. Anyway, while the numeral overprints on the genuine stamp are usually on the right side reading down, 
The forgers were apparently confused and careless, or perhaps were working with too small a printing press and had to do the printing work in turn. So stamps are found with the numbers running in both directions in this period. Stamps with the 69 period overprint uh, tend to be rare and are found with overprints from only a few districts. Saltillo is one of these. I believe that those with the Saltillo name were the first produced. And in the case of Saltillo, the overprint resembles very, very closely. In fact, I would, I, I'd, I would swear they're identical compared to the genuine overprint. What I think happened was there was a duplicate district name sitting around the um, printing plant somewhere, or perhaps in the director general's desk drawer, and they pulled this out and put it to work. And when they were printing the 1869 stamps, they used pilfered paper, so there's no help from the, the paper in identifying them. They only got two things wrong. The numbers are spaced a little wider apart than on the issued stamps. And the 50 centavos has thicker denomination numerals, followed by a period. And this was a type of stamp, or a variety of the stamp, that was not produced until later in 1869. But none were sent to Saltillo in 1869. They only started using this stamp in Saltillo with the 70-year overprint. To my knowledge, there are two covers from the first period. And this one with the 50 centavos is, I think, at least I'll say it's very, very nice. Here are some more first period stamps, 69 overprint. We've got 200 centavos with a Saltillo overprint, a 25 centavo stamp with a fake Mexico overprint, a 50 centavos with Queretaro district overprint, and then the two at the bottom are 50 centavos with Morelia overprints, numbers reading both up and down. The second period is comprised of stamps having the 70 numeral overprints incorrectly reading up at left. Here is one of these stamps, Oaxaca 2370, tied to a Mexico City cover. This is a much more exotic second period cover. In fact, I think it's the only postal forgery cover with a 100 centavo stamp. The second period included one super rarity of the postal forgeries, and that is the stamp on the left, which has denomination figures that are much thinner than what was produced later. These stamps at left were produced in 1868, and some of them were used in 1869, but by the time the postal forgeries were being produced, none of those thin figure stamps, we call them, were being made. So what happened was they found a sheet of unoverprinted stamps somewhere in the printing plant. I don't know why it was there, but they decided to finish it off with fake Mexico name and numbers. I believe there are three copies of this stamp known. If one is trying to get each denomination with as many different district overprints as possible, there are about 40 varieties to collect in the second period. The third period consisted of stamps with a 70-year overprint reading down at the right. Here we've got two rather snazzy multiples of the 25 centavos block of four and a 50 centavos strip of three. I should add that if you're trying to collect all of the third period stamps, there are over 60 varieties to find. The fourth period consists of stamps with the 71 year overprints and the numbers reading down. This block of eight is the second largest used postal forgery multiple of any denomination or period. There are over 80 varieties to collect from this period. There are some exceptions. In this case, these are fourth period stamps with the numbers reading up at left. I only know of the two varieties, the 100 centavo saltillo and the 50 centavos chihuahua. Here we have stamps with no 
district numbers or year overprints. They're always from Oaxaca. There are only a few of the 25 centavos known and only two copies of the 50 centavos. A case could be made for a fifth period, which would be stamps with 72 year overprint, but the only two varieties are known and there's a little bit of question about them. I think it's pretty well settled that the stamps with 2572, which is the district number for Acapulco, are indeed postal forgeries. None were issued that year to Acapulco. Stamps are sometimes found with certificado overprints, registered mail. They're not especially rare, but I have yet to see a registered front with a postal forgery. I really wonder if one exists. I'd love to see one. Some postal forgery covers are known going to foreign destinations. Both of these are going to the same fellow in Toulouse, France. The top one was sent by French ship out of Veracruz, and it has a pair of postal forgeries, both with Carretero name. The lower cover has 25 centavo singles with Morelia and Tampico names and was carried on a British ship. Here's a 50 centavos franked cover going to Bordeaux. Once the fraud was discovered in February 1872, postal authorities had to take steps to minimize the disaster. And this generated a whole new range of varieties. Dr. Randall Grace will tell you about these. Randall? My topic is anatado overprint of Mexico for a continuing solution to the postal forgery problem identified by Nick Follensby. In spite of what he said, the postal forgeries are not easy to detect. It looks like it when he showed it, but in actuality, they're a little difficult. This overprint is considered one of the most difficult overprints in Mexico, and so we're going to spend some time looking at how to accurately identify it and to not be afraid so that others can collect it without worry. The Anatado overprint was the part of the three-part solution to deal with the postal forgeries. It was over 50 days, and the three parts were that they decided they would have to create a new stamp issue called the 1872 issue, so creative in Mexico. It's also called the Garbanacitos, the Dagoan profile. But the other two solutions were they needed to have mail in Mexico during this postal forgery resolution. And so to do that, they decided they would do the Anatado overprint and habliotados. The habliotados are fewer in number than the anotados, being approximately a hundred. The anotados are numerous, but they're compounded by the fact that they're forgeries. The uh, reason for the anotado overprint was created by the Postal Service by a decree in February, Postal Circular 5 by Garay Garay who decided that the anotado had to be placed on all the mail used in Mexico during this interim period following the postal forgeries. The anotado means accounted for or noted because they wanted to be sure they actually accounted for mail and didn't have any more postal forgery use. But the curious problem is that they continued to use postal forgeries because they just had the anotado overprint. So now we have Postal forgeries continuing to be used, but now they're legitimized because they have the anotado overprint on them, at least in the minds of the government, but they can get paid for it now. So how they did this was they decided that they would put the anotado overprint on all the remaining stamps in Mexico City that included postal forgeries and non-postal forgeries. This was about a 65-35 uh, ratio, but they also required all the stamps to be returned to Mexico City to have the anotado overprint placed on them and then exchanged for a legitimate anotados. The anotado overprint is placed on the stamp, usually on the right side, semi-vertical or vertical, and is commonly seen on the lower denomination stamps, the 12 and 25. 
50 centavo stamps, they're not that common. The six centavo is really uncommon. There's no 100 centavo here because it's really, really uncommon. The thing to note here is that this annotado overprint is unusual because it goes horizontal. That's very uncommon. Because of the postal forgeries of the annotado overprint, Stout decided, who is a respected collector of Mexico, to try to determine certain genuine nature of an annotado overprint. He decided he would search for the best annotado overprint he could find. He spent a long time. He selected this cover, took the overprint, put it in the Corel software program, and magnified it two to three times and used it against all other patient uh, annotados that were submitted for certification by using his software program. It's a very elegant process. As I will show you, this isn't a perfect annotado, but it's the one that's been used over the years to assert annotado uh, genuine. The problem with the annotado overprint is that it's difficult to assert. And there's so many criteria. That these are the uh, ex sort of accepted criteria for the annotado overprint currently. And they are uh, with measurements of the uh, annotado overprint, the heights of the letters, particularly the opening in the letter at what part of the clock they are. The points of the large A and the small A have to be present. The annotado overprint always has to be intact, complete, and not obliterated by a cancel or not smudged. So finding good annotados is not exactly the easiest thing in the world. The, the T has to be almost absent. The N looks like an M. There's shading of each letter that has to be characteristic and evaluated. There's small gaps down here in the printing. In addition, other criteria used because most of the cancels have to be Mexico City. The dates of use are inside of these dates for the use of the annotado. This is the 50 days. 50 days are the calendar days. The actual postal days, assuming they didn't do it on Sunday, is 43 because that's seven weeks, 50 days. So the use is a very short period of time. They're mostly found on mint postal forgeries as genuine, and so that's least of a worry. Those seen on cover are probably usually a legitimate. I don't know of forgeries on cover. They're commonly seen in the 12 and 25, few 50s. However, the 6 centavo and 100 centavo raises issues of genuine because these are very, very uncommon. Consignment dates are 70 to 72, rarely 69. They are known from 34 of the 41 districts of Mexico. This is the earliest annotado known on cover. It's dated 3-7. Annotado multiples are uh, not rare. This is a multiple of 12, but it's X Chapman. This is a 25. These are not rare, but they are nice because you can view the annotado overprint. The curious thing about looking at multiples with the annotado overprint is that the annotado overprint isn't the same. Since it's a single overprint device, you'd expect it to be the same. Well, interestingly, it's not the same. And that's true of a lot of multiples. And it's a disparity in determination of the annotado overprint that there's some acceptable boundaries for its determination. But because these are placed by humans, you can't expect the overprint to be perfect always. But we're always, or I'm always looking for the perfect overprint. These are annotado examples. This is an unusual, a little different one. It's on a 50 centavo, uh, now one on cover. This is an annotado combination cover uh, with a 50 centavo, but the uh, annotado overprint is only on this stamp. These other stamps went through the mail but don't have annotados on. These should have had annotados. It's Mexico, what can I tell you? This is a Cancel De La Hencia cancel out of Mexico City because stagecoach is transported mail. This cover has three annotados on it. Uh, multiple annotados on cover are very, very unusual. This is just a very nice cancel. The rarity of the annotados is 100 centavo because there's probably 10 or less. It's only from three districts, Mexico, Morelia, and Mazatlan. This is a second period. Annotado, these are not very common. 
This is the search for the perfect gamma title. It's the best that I can come up with. It's been put in the Corel program, and I'm trying to reproduce some of the stout material using this. I would say the perfect gamma title is elusive. These are uh, examples of postal forgeries with anatado forgeries. These are all forgeries. And one of the things I want to point out is these are mostly 69 year dates. If you look at these, now that you're educated in the anatado overprint, you can tell why they're bad. If you look at this, there's no gaps. Should be gaps. This overprint has a very faint thing, but there's no gaps. There's a cross in the T. That's not supposed to be there. The D is erect, it's supposed to be curved. This overprint, the D is wrong. The A is closed. This is an incorrect large A. This anatidal overprint has a wrong N. These, this D is wrong. This A is wrong. This is an anatidal overprint. This A is wrong. N is wrong. O is wrong. T is wrong. All of this is wrong. So see how easy it is to see anatidal forgeries? Pretty simple. Not really, but once you know it is. This is the uh, last day cover of use of anatidal overprints. I thought it was interesting. Uh, not because it's the last day, which uh, I was fortunate to find, but it also is a 69 dated stamp, canceled Mexico. The reason nobody would want this cover because it's very damaged. Well, I did because as a 69 date, anatidal, the last day to use. So my message to you is, the anatidal overprint is a relatively common to come by. It has uh, forgeries present, but because you can readily identify these with the use of certain criteria, as well as the MEPSI Expertizing Committee can assist you with Mark Gonzalez's help. He can help you with any of these. It's an interesting challenge in an area of Mexico that uh, is quite mind-bending. The next uh, talk is on uh, the Habliotados, but I want to tell you the rest of the story of the Anatados. These were taken off the market in uh, late April the 25th. The denomination of the 1868s was demonetized later in May, and all of the 68 stamps were destroyed for a postal degree and incinerated in 1873. The next part of the story of the solution to the postal forgery issue is by Mr. Cordich, who is a long-term collector of Mexico and one of my mentors. My talk is going to be a little different than the others, and I really have the easiest of the group of postal forgeries to talk about. I'm starting with a map of Mexico, and in this map of Mexico, the 31 postal districts are called out. Some of them that I'd like to start out with, because I'm not going to go back to the map, that are important are Tampico, Veracruz, and if you'll notice, they're both on the Gulf of Mexico, and they're relatively close together. Those stamps seem to be used quite often with a Veracruz cancel, or a Veracruz forged overprint, and a Tampico cancel which is very strange. Most all of the habilitados are postal forgeries, but there are some that are on genuine stamps. Another thing that's kind of interesting is Tabasco is a port. Merida is a port. Oaxaca is not a port, but very close to Veracruz. Puebla, Puebla is very close to Veracruz also. So a lot of these Usages were in the town of Veracruz, and I have a feeling that it was because of maritime usage. The British, through the Royal, Royal Steam Packet Ships, had a monthly ship that would come into Veracruz, and then it would go up to Tampico, and then it would turn back to Veracruz before heading back to England. And a lot of these you'll see are involved with those areas. The numbers that are on here, the 71 is the year, the number at the top represents a district, and there are 41 of them. And it is also 
the district overprint that's on there. In this case, you have a second district overprint over here. That's Jalapa. And that, that is a forgery. The districts had all the overprinting devices. The 271 was applied in Mexico City. And they were never redone. Once they were done and the stamp was originally consigned, that's the only consignment you have. Even though this one was probably used in Jalapa. Anyhow, this is a very scarce six centavo. In fact, I only know of two that were used habilitados. Here's one that was four, represents Puebla. The Veracruz overprint is the habilitado overprint, which is where the stamp was used. Veracruz on a Corretero stamp. Those stamps were sent back when they found out this forgery was going on. Those stamps were sent back to Mexico City and redistributed rehabituated, if you will, habilitado. It's canceled, you have to know this, but it's canceled with a Tampico cancel, and that has to do with the maritime shipping, I think. There's a lot of things we don't know about this stuff. We're making educated guesses. This one is 16 of 70. 16 is the district of Toluca, and this stamp was used in Mexico City. The second overprint is a town south of Mexico City, Cuernavaca. So that is a forged overprint with a Mexico City cancel. This is a, another Toluca, District 16, and Veracruz is the Habilitado overprint, and it was used again in Tampico. This is another Toluca overprint with a Veracruz Habilitado overprint, and the Tampico is the oval cancel that you see. This one is from Oaxaca. It's District 23. The original overprint is over on your left, and the Veracruz is the Habilitado overprint. This is the only hundred centavo known to exist, and it's from the little seaport town of Merida. And the stamp was called back, and it was resent out, and they added the Veracruz Habilitado overprint. About it for, there are very few Habilitados. I'm guessing probably Randall said something about 75, or about 100. I think there are fewer than that. They were all supposed to be called back to Mexico City because of this postal fraud. And then Mexico City distributed some out again to be overprinted a second time by the using district. This was used April 1st of 1872, right towards the end of the Habilitado period. But that stamp never got called back. It only has a single overprint. So this is kind of an exception, as is this. This was sent to Tabasco. It was used in Veracruz, but it never got the Veracruz Habilitado overprint. Apparently, this stamp did not get called back and reissued. This is the same thing used March 30th in 1872. It's a Oaxaca stamp that was used, used in Oaxaca, but right during the middle of the Habilitado period. That's about the end of the Habilitados. Habilitados are scattered. Very few in any one collection. Okay, now I've got some additional postal forgeries, or as, as I call them, Tipo de Mexicos. Those are synonymous terms, but Tipo de Mexicos is the older term. Nick Follinsby insists that they be called postal forgeries. I kind of don't like that because you go to exhibit this stuff, and the APS judges all think, forgeries, what are you exhibiting forgeries for? Well, this happens to be from a little bitty town in the middle of the state of La Scala, and there are very few of these known. Very few sub-office cancels. Most of the cancellations are from big main towns. This one is from District 28, which is Chiapas. The forgers had to create district names because all the district names were at the, at the district offices. They didn't have access to them, so they had to create their own names. This one has a G instead of a C. There are three or four different ones. That's just one example. This one is District Corretero that was used in Guadalajara. And the cancel that's used here is a provisional cancel that was used after the end of the Maximilian issue. They made provisional stamps out of that particular cancellation. And it's a August of 1871 date. There's a block of six canceled Mexico. Big multiples like this are very scarce. But these are tipos, these are postal forgeries. There's a block of four from Corretero. Here is a Cordova 
canceled Puebla. You don't find them very often. Here's a pair from Mazatlan, and it's canceled Veracruz. Well, Mazatlan's completely on the other side. It's on the Pacific coast. Veracruz is on the Gulf of Mexico. So it has to be a postal forgery just on that alone. Pairs are very, very hard to find. Here's a Morelia. It's canceled in San Luis Potosi, which is in the middle of the country. Here's a Tulancingo, which is up in the state of Hidalgo. It's District 15 of 70 with the numbers reversed, the overprints reversed. Here's a Tulancingo canceled Guanajuato. Well, those, those are substantially apart. 1870 stamp, 15 of 1870. So you run into a lot of these things. I can go on and on. I have some others here, but I'm running a little short on time, I think. So I'm going to end it right there. I would like to thank Messrs. Follinsby, Grace, and Cordage for their collective insight into the great Mexican postal fraud of 1870 to 1871. On behalf of the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, I'd like to thank you for having taken the time to visit with us on this video. You'll find that this is one of a number of videos that we've produced over the years in a, the effort to provide educational services to the stamp collecting public. The Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library is located in Denver, Colorado at 2038 South Pontiac Way. Our hours are 10 to 4, five days a week with one day of extended hours. The library offers collectors of every kind and to the general public a host of materials that are related to stamp collecting and world history. There are over 60,000 journals contained in 800 specific journals. We have a map room, we have special collections devoted to individual countries, and we have special libraries that are devoted to individual countries. For further information about the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, we invite you to visit the library or visit us online at our website.